Thank you very much. Uh, today is Tuesday, November the 21st. Welcome to Los Angeles City Hall and to the Los Angeles City Council Chambers. This is the meeting of the City of Los Angeles City Council. The Council meets three times per week on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. All meetings are open to the public, and for those who cannot make it to City Hall, our meetings are televised via cable on Channel 35 or can be viewed by visiting our website. Mr. Reyes, uh, thank you very much. Okay, now we can uh, begin the meeting. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, the meeting is now in session. Would you please call the roll? Cardenas, Grohl, Hahn, Weiser, Labonte, Padilla, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosendahl, Smith, Weiss, Swiss, and Zine Garcetti, 10 members present, and a quorum, Madam President. And before we go into the first item, I would like to ask Mr. Smith if he would rise and lead us in the flag salute. Gentlemen, if you please stand. And place your hand over your heart and repeat with me, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Mr. Smith, first item of business, Madam Clerk. Approval of the minutes. Mr. Weiss moves, Mr. Smith seconds. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Mr. Wesson moves, I believe, Mr. Zine seconds. And Madam President, before beginning the regular agenda, there is a request to continue several items. Item number eight, there is a request from Council Member Zine to continue that matter to December 12th. Uh, seeing no objection, matter is continued. On item number uh, nine, there is a request on behalf of Council Member Garcetti to continue that matter also to December 12th. No objection, the matter is continued. And on item number 59, there is a request uh, from Councilmember Rosendahl to continue that matter to November 29th. 
Again, seeing no objection, that matter is also continued. That will take counsel to the first items on the agenda. Items 1 through 14 are items for which public hearings have been held. Um, Mr. Mr. Weston, you wish to call something special. Mr. Parks would like for us to call special item 14. All right. Mr. Weiss? Um, on item four, there's been a public hearing held, but we have people from the community here who I think would like to speak, so I'll call item four special so we can hear from them. Okay. And Madam President, also for Council's information on item number three, it is a 12-vote item. In addition to the ordinance, uh, 12 votes are required for the general plan amendment, and I don't believe 12 council members will be present today, so I don't know if Council wishes to hold that on the desk or continue that matter. Um, I'm willing to hold it on the desk or? That's an item in my district. Um, okay. Let's uh, go ahead and vote on it today. If we don't expect 12 members, uh, it'll carry over for a second reading, I understand. Okay. Well, in addition to the um, ordinance, there's a general plan amendment that needs 12 votes. I understand. So, okay. Okay, Mr. LaBonge. Thank you, Madam President. Item six, please, special. Thank you. All right, no other specials. So, Madam Clerk, would you please open the roll on the remaining items? Are we Okay, thank you very much. Close the vote. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. Okay. And Next. Madam President, for Council's information, the ordinances go over for one week, and that would be November 28th. Okay, Madam Clerk, next, next item. Next items are items which public hearings have not been held. Items 15 through 62, 10 votes are required for consideration. Members, any specials on those items? Mr. Wesson. On behalf of Mr. Parks, item 30, items 34 and 51. No other specials? And Madam President, there are cards on uh, items 34, 41, 45, and 52. Okay. Would you please uh, open the roll on the remaining uh, items? I'm sorry. Okay. So if you can say that, uh, Madam Clerk, if you can open uh, the roll on the remaining items, please. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. And the ordinances on those items go over for one week also. All right. The next, next items, Madam President, are closed session items 63 through 69, and there is a card on 67. Do you wish to hold those on the desk? Yes, please. And uh, then that would take counsel to the items on the supplemental agenda, items 70 through 83, and those are items for which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Mr. Wesson. Mr. Parks, item 70. All right, thank you. Any other items, council members, that need to be called special? All right, Madam Clerk. Uh, oh, I have, I have a special. Oh, Ms. Hahn. Uh, 80. Thank you very much. <laughs> Madam Clerk, any other items? Uh, there are no cards on any of the other items. All right, then open the roll on the remaining items. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 10 ayes. All right, next order of business. Uh, Madam President, do you wish to take up uh, public comment at this time? Yes, I would. Thank you very much. Our first speaker uh, will be Mr. Robert Carbajal. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Uh, I was here to speak on item 4118D, more police presence, uh, but I don't see L.A. Can here. I'm in favor of it, uh, but I'd also to like to communicate a grievance to you against the city neighborhood uh, nuisance abatement program, the NPP, specifically uh, Dina Sohn Carrion and uh, Mary Claire Moldiner. Uh, I wrote a letter to Mr. Rocky Del Gadillo and beseeched him to address these people and uh, their constant beratement and uh, slander of me through groups in the downtown area trying to work with the community, trying to do something positive. It's kind of hard when you have uh, neighborhood prosecutor people and uh, Captain Smith, your uh, town crier, Don Garza, going around telling people that I'm a violent predator. So I'd appreciate it if you might address that or check that. Uh, I've delivered this to the prosecutor's office and uh, the attorney general's office, and hopefully something can come of it. Thank you very much for your time. Our next speaker will be Mr. Tony Valle. Good morning, esteemed council members. I wish to start by thanking Dennis P. Zine for his generous support for the families of the brave firefighters who recently lost their lives in the line of duty, 
who exemplify the highest and most noble qualities that Christ spoke of when he said, greater love has no man than to lay, his down, than, than to lay down his life for his friends. This story of the firefighter's sacrifice, camaraderie, and bravery stands in stark contrast to the story and allegations that you were presented with in this council room on November the 8th. You may have felt that it was in the best interest of the taxpayers to settle the case presented by Rocky Delgadillo and award a black firefighter, Tenny Pierce, $2.7 million. However, as details began to emerge about Tenny's behavior, including his own involvement in racially motivated pranks, conflicting stories began taking shape. Incriminating pictures were presented that demonstrated Tenny taking an active and exuberant role as a firefighter, goofing off and participating in some outrageous pranks himself. Although Tenny seemed to relish the role of the prankster, he did not expect a, pr a prank to be pulled on him. The man whom we all know is a self-proclaimed big dog has tried to take a huge bite out of a meal ticket that could have made him a very rich but disgraced man. But you will not let this happen today on your watch or when you vote on this next week. I urge you to support the leadership of council members Rosendahl, Smith, and Zine, who recognize this settlement for what it is, an outrageous scam of precious taxpayer dollars. I urge every council member present here today to vote yes in favor of a new motion to suspend payment of the $2.7 million award. Every constituent will be anxiously watching how you vote on this motion. Please consider the stark contrast between the character of the big dog and the real men who sacrificed their lives on our behalf, fighting together as a team of brothers. I'd like to request that also my speech be uh, made available to council members that were not Thank here. you very much, sir. Uh, our next speaker will be Tom Watson. I believe Mr. Watson is in Van Nuys. And if there's nobody here... Yeah. Hold on, okay, watch. Yes. Some of you know me also as Zuma Dog, and first of all, I'd like to say this whole meeting's a violation of the Brown Act because there's no agendas here in Van Nuys. Then I was told to go to the office. They say no agendas. So I came here to talk on agenda items, no agendas. This whole meeting's going to have to be reconsidered. Every item, you may as well cancel it now. Now let's talk about something else. Everybody knows Zuma Dog, public speaker, came in here to about Venice Beach. Now I talk about things like H. Proposition R. Nobody, I'm told, nobody in the history of Los Angeles has spoken more times at this podium on the issues against city council for fraud, waste, and abuse than you add that up with all my calls on KABC radio and on the blogs and on public access. And what happens? City council put the fix in. They said, get Zuma, dog. We don't care what it is. Catch him for chewing gum. So I'd like to say for people who missed my meeting on Wednesday, Zuma, dog, while seated in the peanut gallery, not being disrespectful a rogue cop approached me and said you're under arrest and I said what and he slaps on the handcuffs he says yes from now on no warnings from now on no leaving for the day you get arrested starting now and the cuffs went on and officer Landry squoze the cuffs so hard he was squeezing and squeezing with all his might I had to go to the hospital I've suffered a contusion of the wrist why if you're a, I first of all I will beat this in court because I was not in violation but the point is if somebody is in violation they should be arrested in a dignified manner they shouldn't suffer police brutality excessive force and I hope City Council I know you've had enough of Zuma dog talking against your fraud waste and abuse but I hope you are not happy what happened with Officer Landry and the excessive force, I shouldn't be suffering permanent physical damage at the hands of police brutality for speaking out against your shadiness. You should be ashamed of yourself, and I hope you... Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. City Attorney, I think you would like to give some uh, advice on the record. The fact that there's no agendas at the Van Nuys, uh, tele it's not a teleconference, it's the video hookup is not a Brannock violation. All right, and as a courtesy, we will make sure that they are uh, there uh, in subsequent uh, uh, meetings. Our next speaker will be Valinda Jo Wright. Good morning. I hope you guys have a really nice Thanksgiving. Um, optimistic, that was the title of a 1993 number one song. Parental warning labels were a hot item. The Cosby's were the number one show on television. 
Today the songs that blow on the stereos on Vernon past the Kingdom Hall paint a bleak, a bleak picture, be this, MF that, MLK shirts I discovered on 11-7 uh, have been replaced by Tony Montana, AKA Scarface. Uh, T-shirts inhabited by uneducated, at-risk young men. I would like to congratulate the men and women, the faceless and the written about public servants who serve humanity, a calling that is even at entry level by no means a light endeavor, but a balanced checkbook is always a cause for optimism. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Mr. Chuck Tenen. Morning, council members, Chuck Tennant, Valley Village. Uh, first, I have a complete up-to-date vacancy rate in Los Angeles by zip codes, all of it. The up-to-date, Herb Wesson has a copy. Very important issue, vacancy rate versus 1295.2. Two classes of affected tenants. One class comes under conversions, the other, which is supposed to be protected under 1295.2, but it's not. The other class of affected tenants is demolitions. They're not protected under 1295.2. Yet both classes get evicted under the Ellis Act. Both classes get displaced. Is there really any human impact difference between conversions and demolitions affected tenants that lose their housing? This is 2006. In 1988, $300 an apartment, you got $3,200, you could survive for 10 months. Now in 2006, five times that rate, $3,200 will get you one month. 1295.2, a municipal code that has not been enforced for 26 years. So why did they pass it? If it's not enforced because of legal issues, were legal issues an issue when it was passed? So why now? Or does the state dictate to the city of LA and the city attorney that they can or cannot enforce it during a housing crisis? You have loss of affordable housing, displacement of tenants, insufficient tenant protection and relocation, soaring rents and worsening crisis. So it's imperative to add demolitions to 1295.2 and have only one class of evicted, affected tenants to smooth out the rough edges in LA's growing housing crisis. Thank you, and I wish each council member happy Thanksgiving. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Candido Moraz. Thank you, Madam President, and the name is Candido Maras. I've been here since 1991. One day we'll get that uh, right. Let me just show something, folks. I want to show you a great event. This happened on Saturday, and it was fantastic. It was fantastic to see the next governor and the next mayor of the city of Los Angeles working together, putting aside their differences so that they can make an event happen. Saturday was a wonderful event. We from the, uh, the Valley brought out over 150 people. Ms. Hahn, it was a pleasure to work with you and the mayor uh, at the Watts cleanup. My question is, we are having an event this coming Saturday in Van Nuys, and don't we as a community have a right to celebrate? Every obstacle has been placed in our way from taking down our banners. <coughs> now I'm told that Street Services is saying that our permit for street closure is possibly going to be uh, revoked. I ask you, do we have a right to celebrate? We do have a right to celebrate. And again, Ms. Hahn, it was a wonderful event working with you and the mayor on Saturday. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Mr. Bruce Darian, who is also out in Van Nuys. Council President Perry and uh, City Council, good morning. Uh, last week I spoke on the $500 million bond issue. Uh, the, the council had voted to uh, put it aside for a while and was unprepared on it. I wanted to put into perspective, uh, years ago this, there were Senate hearings in uh, strengthening the False Claims Act. Congress had hearings on the matter. 
that it was established that as much as 10% of the entire federal budget is lost to fraud. With the city having a five to six billion dollar a year budget, it amounts to 500 to 600 million dollars a year is lost to fraud on the 10% uh, um, uh, valuation of uh, fraud to uh, the budget. Uh, with $600 million in relation to how long uh, this current mayor has been in office, a year and a half, that's $900 million. That would pay cash to uh, new uh, uh, police uh, buildings complete. There would be no need for a bond because the city does not have the money and has to go to a bond, which will be paid over 30 years with interest. This puts into perspective a little bit as to how much is being wasted to fraud. The city is not capable and has not taken enough action in rooting out fraud in the city of Los Angeles. I've been talking for months over the fraud of the Malibu Pier. It is a gross accounting and public works scandal that's been covered up. And it's time now to take some action. People of Los Angeles are relying on you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Mr. Michael Hunt. Good morning, Council. I guess it reappeared. I'd like to thank LA Times for being the number one newspaper in the country. Um, he, he, here's what I have to say. I'm what America looks like today. I am America. America is me. It shows you no matter what the cause was and no matter what the issue is, it's still about jobs, it's still about work, and it's still about hum humanitarian. Um, I have this to say to you. God showed up 900,000 times, and, and he, he's warning you guys. He's, he, he, he's sending a direct warning to you guys. He says, you know, I am one of his soldiers. Ralph Waldo Emerson says, I will not send cowards to do God's work. Listen to him. This was an act of God. I had no control over this. But he's letting you know that I am his soldier, and he's sending me to deliver a message to you guys. The message is jobs, housing, welfare of people. Everybody needs a job. Everybody needs to work, no matter what you say. You can arrest me. You can do anything you want to do for me, but God still shows up. I can fill out the paperwork when they arrest me. That's how good I am. You know, so I'm not afraid. Like Dr. King says, I've been to the other side of the mountain, and I'm, I'm coming back. I'm, you know, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of any man. I'm not afraid of anybody. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. You guys violated our constitutional rights. That's why I'm here. That's the only reason why I'm here. You know, you guys violated my First Amendment rights and my civil rights. I am not here to be a politician. And I'm not here to be in your business. I am only here because you guys violate my civil rights. So, you guys got to get it together. God's still going to show up. Thank you very up. much. Our next speaker will be Mr. or Ms. Lervin Schatz. A Mr. or Ms. Lervin Schatz. Is there someone here by that name? Thank you very much. Yeah, that's me. Gyla Lervin Schatz. It's easy. And what a great day that was for us. A great week. Had one of the outlaws arrested. I got to apologize to the 15th district because that should have been a, a great day. Great publicity shot. You know, and, and, and we were ejected and you know, I, I woke up and I found this copy of the LA Times. So I opened it, I don't know if it's a special edition or what. And, and it's, it's like everywhere I looked, it's Michael Hunt. You know, it's, he's right. It's an, it's, it's an act of God. But not only that, it's, it's a payback also for a, you know, a council member for getting up last Wednesday and calling the LA Times inaccurate a number of times with Mr. Fujioka here. So they gave you an accurate. It's a huge victory. I have people coming up to me. So many people are watching this. In the weekend, I'm at a party, and they're like, oh, yeah, we, you know, we love everything you do. It's great. We're, like, we've, 
We've transformed people into watching the ultimate reality show. You know, Guy Gabaldon must be laughing. Ed Roybal, all those people. Rolling in the aisles like we were because, man, you must have needed paramedics in the city of Los Angeles because these are the times. The Los Angeles Thank you time. very much. Our next speaker will be Sylvia Lynn Hawkins. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ms. Sylvia Lynn Hawkins. Uh, this is a warning to all people that are trying to rule the planet, the moon, and the earth under to escape to it. It would not work taking things off of the planet, killing all flying things in the sky, over a hundred different elements to use for hospitals for medication. These scientists is lying of the evidence or the sun that collapsed with darkness on last Sunday or two weeks ago. It was my power, Victor, ruling on display. It's my power that is causing the sun to decrease for snow in Los Angeles less than three to five years. And not just in the counties of California, but the 50 states. These people are disrespecting your soon to be president, which is myself, Victor Ruling, power. These people are not, are again, are only trying to give attention only to men who first walked the moon and not to myself, whom is a woman. I'm asking all men, do not get on any moon, do not get on any planet that have came back again to Devil 3, to Devil 01. The planets went back, came back, burnt. It was my power that commanded 40 million miles backwards. If you get on the planet, it is a possibility you will die with my kick out power. That is present again. I ask all, do not go under. Casey Price, son, do not go under the earth and start a collision of fire, or all would die. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. And, Mr. City Attorney, I believe and, you. And just, just for the record, that did not appear to be within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. City Attorney. And our next speaker will be Michael Carrion. Yes, my name is Michael Carrion, and I'm here to clarify a few things that were discussed last week. Uh, this is to the whole city council. Uh, yet last week after I spoke, Mr. Reyes got up and uh, made a few comments. I'd just like to make sure that for the record, these comments are verified. Number one, Mr. Reyes, your office only spoke to me one time. You said there's an ongoing communication. There's not an ongoing communication. Number two, I never received an answer for why I received a letter of something that was supposed to have been done. Number three, after your assistant came up and spoke to me. Ma Madam President, he should be directing his remarks to the council as, to the as a whole. Yes, refer please. to Mr. Reyes in the third person would be it, more appropriate. It's for what his conversation would be, sir. refer to the, the chair, not to individuals on Pardon the council. Me? Please refer to the chair speak, and If you want to speak, please hold comments. my clock. Okay? Please proceed. Okay. Mr. Reyes made a few comments that were wrong, okay? Mr. Reyes Mr. implied Attorney, that these were done. To... Okay, that's okay? fine, okay. These comments were not correct. Now, according to the Brown Act, I'm, my understanding is that you guys are not supposed to respond to these things. But on that day, Mr. Reyes responded to several items that were spoken of. Apparently, everybody in the city of Los Angeles is wrong except Mr. Reyes. And I am not saying Mr. Reyes is wrong. I am saying his staff is misleading him. Mr. Reyes has an employee by the name of Sonia Jimenez, who also worked for the 14th District prior to this. And she has a record of doing this. Okay, She misleads people, and she doesn't file the right papers. I, my complaint was never for the outside of the Belmont High School. My complaint was for the inside of Belmont High School. But yet Mr. Reyes got up and said, oh, the outside is clean. I don't know what he's talking about. Well, one more time, Mr. Reyes, you're wrong. 
Thank you. Our next speaker will be Mr. Robert Kitson, please. Good morning. My name is Robert Kitson, and I'm Jeannie Harrison's law partner. My law firm represents firefighter Tenny Pierce. Mayor Viragosa's veto of the settlement in Mr. Pierce's case announced yesterday simultaneously with yet another zero tolerance program is the height of hypocrisy. Nothing sends a stronger signal that harassment will in fact be tolerated than the veto of that settlement. Tenny Pierce was not being compensated merely for swallowing dog food. Tenny Pierce was being compensated for the loss of a career which was barely half over which he loved and which he had dedicated his life to, which he was harassed out of when he reported that two white captains had fed a black man dog food while on duty at a fire station. The phones at my law firm ring off the hook with calls from firefighters who report acts of harassment and discrimination every day. The workplace policies of the fire department are caught in a different, darker, uglier era. Far worse than the monetary cost that is sure to follow is the human cost. Yesterday, it became that much harder for these citizens and employees of the city to live lives of equal dignity with their coworkers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Donna Dougherty. Following Ms. Dougherty will be Larry Mays. Good morning. May I ask all of you to take a piece of paper that was given to you, uh, which shows the hello, hello out there. This is a piece of paper right here that shows the Griffith Observatory. And if everybody has that, uh, if you would look at it, and you will see where the two, um, on either side, there are um, little signals that say the disabled will go in the back side of each wing. Actually, two years ago, that picture was given to me, not the top part, of course, but the picture itself was given to me by Rec and Parks Department. And um, the West Wing, the one door on the back side of the West Wing was supposed to be designated for disabled. That was two years ago. I hate to say it, but the latest press kit that came out at the opening of the observatory also has a picture quite like this. And it states that both people, all disabled people, will go up around those two doors. Now, as I mentioned before, because of what Councilwoman Hahn said, either you make it accessible for everybody or you close it to everybody. So that's what happened. I mean, can you imagine putting your head in the sand and sticking your tail up to get it shot? You got it. And we, we have the front four doors closed, and I have spent more than a week now calling everybody in this city trying to find out if they're ever going to open them again. And uh, now I'm being asked to provide for the Rec and Parks Department the codes, the 504, the Title 24, everything else that goes to say we must make that front entrance accessible because it is a new structure. It is not old anymore. It is new, and it fits in under all the Title II, and we shouldn't even have to do that. Where is our compassion? Please. Thank, Thank you. you very much, ma'am. Mr. Larry Mays is our next and final speaker for public comment. Good morning. My name is Larry Mays, and uh, I'm just going to speak on some general things. Uh, I've been in the city quite a while, and I, I work with the community. I, I'm an evangelist. I preach all through the neighborhood. You probably see me. I care balance says, ask Jesus to save you now. Now you got whole schools are turning back to the Lord. Crime is going down. And see, you can take a gun from a person, he'll kill you again, but if you give him a change of heart, that'll change. That prevent crime. You see, 
police will come after the fact. But if you give a person a new heart, which is Jesus, that a change. So we're having a great move in the city, and it's time for y'all to support what's working. And if we take care of God's business, God will take care of our business. The whole thing is the city, the nation. We're going to have to turn back and support what God is doing. We're building our house and not building God's house. If we take care of his business, God will bless our city. He'll bless our nation. But we want to throw God out of it. We want to put everything before God. So y'all get out and help me. I've been out here five months, and the crime's going down. All the schools are coming to the Lord. The kids are coming to the Lord, the gangbangers and everybody, five or 600 a day. So y'all try to support me. I'll stick around with you a while. God bless you, and I love every one of you, and God love you. Let's get them out on something worthwhile. Thank you very much. That closes the public comment. Madam Clerk, next order of business. Madam President, uh, 12 council members are present at this time. Do you wish to reconsider the items that were uh, the ordinances that were over a week um, so that way they could be adopted on first consideration? Yes, uh, and please. that would be items 1, 2, and 3, and items 15 through 21. All right. Would you like to open the roll on those items? Do you want to do them individually? Oh, no. no. All right, collectively. All right, would you please open the roll? Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. And now the ordinances are before council, and that's 1 through 3 and 15 through 21. All right, again, would you please open the roll? Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Thank you very much. Next order of business. Okay. Next item before. Uh, Madam Clerk, I understand uh, 12 members were not expected, but we seem to have 12 members now. I'd like to move reconsideration of item number three. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Very efficient. Thank you very much. Madam Next item, Madam President, is item number four, and that was called special for cards. Uh, Mr. Weiss moved to public hearing on that item. Uh, Mr. Weiss, uh, let me check. Do you need to make a motion on that to reopen the public hearing? I, yes. So I'm happy to make the motion right. to reopen for a six-minute public hearing. And I'd like to just speak for a moment before the public hearing begins, Madam President. Please proceed. Um, colleagues, this, uh, this is the now perennial issue of mansionization throughout the city. Um, and uh, I, I think it's important as we address it to be cautious and deliberate in, in how we uh, deal with it, and especially to be cautious and deliberate in the area of ICOs. I know a lot of you have received numerous requests, you probably receive one every week, every time you go to a homeowner association for an ICO. Um, it's the same way in my district uh, in Beverly Grove for a long period of time, far too long, but that's life, guys. Uh, we've been meeting with both sides to try to come up with a workable, temporary solution uh, while engaged in, in, a, in a more uh, overarching, long-term discussion about how to deal with the problem. Uh, I believe we've reached an appropriate conclusion that basically uh, deals with the issue of FAR. That is the ICO that is before you today, and we're going to hear from members of the community. I want to thank folks on both sides of this issue for working so hard. I, I know that no side is completely satisfied with this resolution. I don't think there is a resolution that can completely satisfy both sides. I apologize for that, but that is the dilemma you face, but I appreciate um, the collegial spirit in which all have addressed the issue. Thank you, Madam President. Six Thank minutes. you, Mr. Weiss. Uh, what would be your pleasure? Would five minutes on each side be sufficient, or what would you like? I mean, the matter has been heard extensively. I would say a six-minute total public hearing is it. All right. All right. Um, why don't we uh, allow each speaker one minute each, and we'll start with the um, opposition. Uh, first speaker is Patricia Perkel, followed by Charles Tarlow. Patricia Percal, followed by Charles Tarlow. If you would come to the podium. Is Ms. Per Percal or Percal With all here? due respect, Ms. Percal is too nervous to speak before you. Uh -huh. And uh, I came with a three-minute talk. I was told it's only two minutes. Now you're saying one minute. If I can't have three, I've narrowed it down. I can pump it out in two minutes. Uh, let me ask the council person of the district, what would you like to? 
All right, please proceed. Okay, this is a truncated version. This ICO is ill-advised for many reasons, not the least of which is that it is in conflict with its own objectives. It purports to encourage housing that will meet the needs of the community now and into the future, when in reality it will stop the building of the very homes that meet today's needs, not to mention the needs of the future. If I had more time, I could elaborate on the many logical, well-thought-out reasons why this ICO is counterproductive. But the truth is that it shouldn't matter. We don't want it. The proponents of this ICO went before the Neighborhood Council to solicit support and were rejected soundly when hundreds of neighbors spoke out against them. The Neighborhood Council declined to support this ICO. There is no doubt in my mind that if you lived in our neighborhood on one of the targeted streets of this ICO, we would not be here today. We would, be, we would not be here because you would not want to stop the building of beautiful homes that enhance your neighborhood and raise your property values. Imagine you own a small cracker box house built in 1927 with inadequate electricity, limited closet space, and pitifully little people space. I'm sure you would want the ability to replace that home with a modern structure that is cost effective to build. Or maybe you don't want to build a new home. Maybe you are elderly on a fixed income and your home is your most valuable asset. Tell me now you want to implement a law that will take away your security to pacify a few people who don't like change. I don't think so. Around the corner, a good law is coming. A neighborhood character initiative is proposing practical limits to height and size that will allay any reasonable fears of mansionization while allowing for natural growth and improvements to neighborhoods citywide, including our neighborhood. We ask that you allow the process to go forward without complicating it with this bad law. We ask that you allow our neighborhood to continue to evolve in a positive way. We ask that you give, uh, that you respect the majority of the people on the targeted streets and give priority to the will of the people. We ask you to vote no on this ICO. Thank you very much, sir. And again, I uh, would like to note that Ms. Percal, Percal was called and you indicated that she did not wish to speak. Um, our next speaker uh, for the pro side will be Marsha Lewin, followed by Barry Karras. Actually, I'm Marsha Latner. The Latner family has owned our home on Fifth Street for over 40 years. The planning department made a strong case for setting new limits on home size. Clearly, mansionization poses a grave risk to the character of our neighborhood and our city, as well as a challenge for the city. On behalf of the homeowners and residents of Beverly Grove, I want to thank our council member Jack Weiss for investing his time, his staff, and not just a little of his political capital to address this problem. We, agree, we greatly appreciate the efforts and attention of the city's planning commission and your council's planning and land use management committee. Both of these bodies have already held public hearings on the matter and both recommended adoption of the ICO for which we are so very grateful. Let me just add that in approving an ordinance to limit home size in Beverly Grove, this council will earn not only my appreciation, but the thanks of a grateful neighborhood. Thank you and happy Thanksgiving to you all. Thank you, our next speaker. Hello, I'm Barry Karras. I own a home on Drexel Avenue, and I want to make an important point about community support for the ICO. Those of us here today represent hundreds of homeowners who went on record in favor of the ICO. The next page in your packet shows headlines that reflect public outrage over mansionization. A couple of years ago, a group of Beverly Grove neighbors got together to explore the ICO. We took the Sunland Tahunga ICO as our model, but we used a much more liberal FAR. The campaign drew overwhelming support. Well over 300 Beverly Grove homeowners signed petitions in favor of our ICO proposal. These support include, supporters include Steve McDonald and Mike Fuhrer. Following a, su a successful grassroots petition drive, our council member sent out his own survey letter and got a huge response. By nearly two to one, Beverly Grove homeowners and residents want tighter limits on home size. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Shelley Wagers, followed by Joanne Silver. Thank you. I'm Shelley Wagers. My husband and I have owned our home on Fifth Street for 16 years. Uh, Beverly Grove is surrounded by neighborhoods that all have 
uh, prohibitions on oversized houses and all enjoy high property values. That has made Beverly Grove a magnet for mansionization and the people who want to keep it that way have forecasted economic hardship if new limits are put on home size. The fact is mansionization is not good for property values and making a quick buck on a given property is not beneficial to long-term property values. The real bottom line, air, light, privacy, and neighborhood character do more for long-term property values than massive houses with no sense of proportion or context. For most Beverly Grove homeowners, our homes are very important assets. When we support limits on home size, we're voting our conscience and our pocketbook. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Mr. Alex Harwood. Hello, thank you. Um, I've lived in the Beverly Grove for nine years, owned my home, a 1920s cracker box home that I love very much. And um, I very much support this proposal. And um, those of you who work alongside Jack Weiss know that he places a high value on property rights and on consensus. So you know that this ICO respects property rights and has broad community support or Jack Weiss would not support it. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. There are no more cards. Uh, Mr. Weiss, would you like to conclude? Thank you, Madam President. Colleagues, um, uh, as you heard, and, and I, as I suspect is the case in all of your districts, whenever these sorts of issues come up, you will never have acclamation, you will never have unanimity. And I, and I do believe that the points made on the other side are quite valid and legitimate. I think we have to be very cautious when we move in this area of mansionization because people have property rights, they have vested interests, their families have uh, vested interests and investments in the homes they own, and I think we need to move with caution. And ICO is just that, it is interim. At the same time, on a separate long range trap, I see the planning department nodding their heads here, we have some really good innovative uh, plans and ideas that are, that are underway that, that I think hopefully will, will provide us with a reasonable way to deal with these issues, not just in this neighborhood, but in similar neighborhoods throughout the city. So I ask for your support of the ICO. Thank you very much, Mr. Weiss. Madam Clerk, would you please? Oh, Mr. Labonge. Yeah, thank you very much, Madam President, Mr. Weiss, on this matter here. Can I have the planning department come to the table, please? could identify yourself, and I think it's your first time at the table. When you speak, you speak to the chair sure. and uh, feel comfortable um, there. Betsy Wiseman for the Planning Department and... Eric Lopez, Planning Department. Thank you. And I, I support this ICO, and I think it's real important because you don't know uh, all that is happening. It gives a chance to breathe. In this breath that we're taking here, and uh, is the issue of mansionization being looked at by the Planning Department, and where are we on that? Because that is one of my ideas that I'm trying to champion for all of Los Angeles from Chatsworth to San Pedro. Thank you. Betsy Wiseman. Yes, we certainly understand that this goes way beyond the Beverly Grove area. We are working on a citywide proposal, a neighborhood character study. In the last two weeks, we've had four workshops in four different areas of the city, in the valley, um, south, west, and there was one here downtown. And all of those were very well attended. They are looking at the long-term or permanent ordinance or solution to deal with the issues of mansionization and to see what we may be able to come up with on a citywide basis that will address these concerns which have been expressed in numerous areas of the city. We do have several other ICOs in effect and we're looking at the issues involving all of those. We hope to move forward with our proposals based on, we're just analyzing the information that we got from the workshops in the last two weeks and we hope to move forward with something early in the beginning of next year. Thank you, and have you looked at other cities throughout the country? Because I know, could you give me some description? 
And you could hold my time, Madam Clerk. Yes, absolutely. The first thing we did was do extensive um, literature review and talking to other cities throughout the country and certainly in California and look at all the different tools and methods that are being used that we might be able to apply on this particular issue and to see how much we could get in terms of agreement to at least stop the most egregious efforts, issues of mansionization while still maintaining property rights. And have anyone looked at uh, doing any basement work? Because I know basements aren't big in Los Angeles per se, but I know people sometimes want to expand their home, but they could look at it in a different way. Have you looked at that? We've looked at it in the sense that if we're going to be dealing with FAR and looking at bulk and scale, that the issues that people deal with in mansionization are primarily what they see above the ground and that FAR in a basement does not count. I mean, the square footage in a basement does not count towards the FAR the way building and safety um, does it now. Right. Well, thank you very much, planners. Appreciate that, Mr. Weiss, who support this here and come back. I think mansionization, the issues uh, are very important. And I do believe that on property values, property values will, as long as we work to make our city better, will always be uh, on the high road. Uh, but the issue of fairness to people is something we always got to contend with. But the fairness is, is how you balance it out, is how you look at a neighborhood. And I know in my district sometimes, all of a sudden, someone has exercised their current right and built a, what is a oversized parcel on an oversized uh, situation that does change the character of the neighborhoods. Because the most important thing, and I want to make sure the city attorney's office hears this, is the character of neighborhoods and to protect neighborhoods. And that's what the planning department is uh, trying to do. So I support you on this, Mr. Weiss. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Labonge. Uh, there are no further speakers in the queue. Madam Clerk, would you please open the roll? Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Next matter. Next item is item number six, and that was called special by Council Member LaBange. Thank you, sir. City staff here on this issue? City staff to report on the city's mural program, restoration program. Right. Mr. Thomas, identify yourself, please, and nice introduction. Leslie Thomas, uh, Department of Cultural Affairs. Right, give us a little report on this, Mr. Thomas. Okay. This is a uh, report that our department uh, made um, in response to uh, the Arts Parks uh, Committee, particularly with regards to uh, the mural restoration program uh, in, in our city. Um, shedding some light particularly on an, on an event that happened some time ago with the destruction uh, of a mural. What we have done, uh, we have presented to council uh, suggestions and recommendations as to what we can do to work with mural restoration in the city. One of those strong recommendations uh, has been to uh, had a multi-departmental task force, and we're glad to report this morning that we have had three other departments that have expressed interest in being on that task force to be able to look at our mural restoration projects. Uh, the library, uh, El Pueblo, and the Department of Recreation and Parks. Why don't we get the Los Angeles Police Department on there? And the only reason I didn't mention them, yeah. Council Harry Ito, where they are, are they you? There. The only reason I didn't mention them is because they are, they are already listed in the uh, in the motion, but LAPD right. is, and the city attorney's office plays a significant role, and also the building and safety. Very good there, Leslie. I just think members, our city, uh, along with some other great cities in the world, have the largest collection of murals, and we've been hurt yeah. uh, by vandals who have uh, operated in such a way here. And is Jerry Miller here? Because uh, Mr. Miller, I don't know if the CLA's here, or the CL, Mr. Karsh, uh, on this issue, I want a motion so when anyone vandalizes a mural, that when they go to court, they don't get the option of community service or jail time, because they're all taking jail time and they're doing no community service. And I think we need to get community service back to help us uh, clean, restore, and do anything to restore these wonderful murals that are throughout the city that artists work very hard on. So uh, if you could make a note of that, because I know the sheriff talked about that recently, that right. people are getting out of jail by saying they'll take jail time 
and they do know community service. Community service would be helpful. Do you use community service in your department at all, Mr. Thomas? Yes, we do. Good. So yes. you could use some more community service Absolutely. on that. So, Mr. Thomas, thank you. And I appreciate you. this. I know I work very closely with Ms. Perry. Uh, we have an amendment coming up that I'm going to support Ms. Perry on, who's been a champion of this, because yeah. murals within her district have been harmed uh, by, uh, by not just vandals, but by those who uh, didn't understand the value of art. Thank you, Mr. President. Welcome back. Congratulations, too. Thank you very much, Mr. Labange. Uh, Mr. Reyes is next, and then Ms. Perry. Thank Councilmember Labange for bringing this forward. And um, murals are, I believe, part of the cultural experience in Los Angeles. Uh, I think back in the 60s and 70s, we had an explosion of artwork that reflected a sense of uh, pride for many groups uh, throughout the city. One in particular, Chicano Time Trip on Daly and Broadway mm -hmm. had gone to uh, disrepair, was tagged, was fading. Able to speak to the artists, they were still around. $25,000 later, we repaired it, brought it back to its glory, put a layer of wax on it so when they do tag it, we can clean it off. But my question to you is, do we have a systemic approach? There are many, many murals in the east side and northeast uh, that reflect this political and cultural explosion that occurred in the 60s and 70s. How are we approaching this issue? How comprehensive are we? And, and can you give me a status of where the department is at when it comes to this type of effort? Please hold my time. Right now, the, the department has uh, an, uh, an approval process, uh, Councilman, for anyone that wants to, uh, any mural that, has to, that is certified, it has to go through an approval process uh, by the department. Uh, one of the stipulations of that approval process is that uh, they have to present to the department evidence as to how the, the mural can be uh, maintained, um, how it can be, uh, it can be kept up, because that's one of the main, the main considerations is, is, is maintenance when we have our, our murals. But do we have a budget to bring them back to life if they've been severely damaged, or is it just by chance? given the will of the council member and or stakeholders? I think when you, if you look at the, the department's uh, current budget, we have a, uh, we have a very uh, small uh, appropriation for, for murals. However, it is not um, where it needs to be. And it is one of the things that uh, as we have, we're moving forward with our budget submission for next fiscal year, we are requesting additional funding uh, to assist us with, uh, with murals, mural, mural restoration. Do we have a document that reflects where they're located, when it was completed, and who were the artists? Yes, we do. Well, we have that documentation. We have that in the, in the department. That's, that is available. Could I trouble you for a copy for District 1? Absolutely. Because as, as uh, construction continues and improvements occur in certain buildings, we tend to lose it. And I know that, got, that gets a little tricky when it comes to property owners' rights. But I just want to get a, a feel for where we're at and, and, and how much we need. Do we have an assessment of how much we would need if we were to upgrade and bring these murals back to life? Do we have a, a cost for that? Um, I think the last, when we, we, did, our, uh, we, we did our report, we, we are looking at um, a figure that uh, goes up into like a quarter of a million plus. A quarter of a million? Plus. Plus. Yes, yeah, for all of the murals. We have over 300 murals in the city. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Ms. Perry. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. President. I also wanted to thank Mr. Labonge for supporting my amendment to request um, additional funding of $75,000 to continue restoration work um, and that, um, that the allocation of funding be used to, to conduct a professional inspection survey of the 300 city-sponsored murals with respect to the uh, uh, status of viable anti-graffiti coatings. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rosendahl is next, and then Mr. Parks. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Mr. President. Welcome back from your long trip. We're happy to have you back. Uh, do you have any information on what you're doing in the 11th district with these monies, which is the coastal district? 
That's a part of, of, of our report. I can get that. Uh, yeah, get I'd that like the you. specifics uh, for Venice. Mm -hmm. You might know this, that the Venice Arts Council and the Voice of the Canals are actually doing a fundraiser to restore a mural in the district. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, um, you know, Judy Baca, who's the um, historic figure in murals in our great city, yeah. has many murals that are in disrepair. And we've been fundraising to repair them. In fact, the Venice Neighborhood Council uh, was donating $20,000, limited money, to assist them in it. So we haven't gotten, and frankly, the Cultural Affairs Department has not been supportive um, lately of the Venice Arts Council and the Voice of the Canals under the previous leadership that is no longer there. So here's where I'm at. Num number one, I'd like to know what's happening in the 11th District. Number two, I might do what Ms. Jan Perry just did, have a supplemental motion uh, for my district's murals, which are falling apart. As you know, throughout the city, graffiti is taking them over, uh, fading over time and weather are taking them over. Uh, but we in Venice historically have been one of the yeah. mural capitals of the world. So A, get me a breakout for the sure. district, and B, uh, be prepared for some motion from me asking for city funds for some of those murals as well. Thank you. Okay, we'll do thank it. you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, that is our last speaker, excuse me. Anybody else? There is a public speaker card. We have had a public hearing, so it would require somebody to reopen the public hearing for that. And if there is no motion, I'm sorry. Mr. LaBonge? I just want to also say Ken Twitchell, who uh, did wonderful work as a muralist, uh, to stand up for all those artists is real important. I know we lost one of his works on Union Avenue with the great Steve McQueen on a building. Just right. lost its way. We shouldn't lose it. Let's move ahead and keep us informed what we could do more of, because this is important art that inspires people. Well, Thank you. Um, for the record, we did have a speaker card from Candido Mars, but we didn't reopen the hearing. Okay, open the roll for the vote, please. And, and Mr. President, this is as, an, as amended. As amended, correct. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. That is approved. Next item, please. Item number 14, call special by Council Member Parks. All right, Mr. Parks, item number 14. No, not, not 14. No, sir, I didn't. Uh, that's a mistake. I didn't call 14. Okay. That was called on your behalf, I believe. Okay. That was, that was an error then. Mine right. were 34, 70, okay. and 51. Well, on 14 then. Again, there's been a public hearing uh, already for that, so we will open the roll on 14, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. That is approved. Next item, please. Item number 22, call special for cards from the public. Okay, item 22 is before us. Um, we have uh, M Sylvia Lynn Hawkins is our first speaker. Uh, Felice Validas, and I would like to say to all Board of Education, Election, Rural Council Board members, as we continue elections and appointment people in office position, college trustees, governors, mayors, and council members of the City Hall of Los Angeles Council and all 58 states. We must not again register or vote. We must change directions. All die boat machines and other machines are set by Senator Harold Ford Jr. and others as they are fired out of United States of America government, Sylvia and Lisa government, in less than three months. All must move to new location of living, all in houses and, and in any location where you are registered to vote. Again, never again vote again or register vote because this is their government registration form, not United States of America. All green cards, parties, and gold cards are, are green or liberal parties of numbers is killing all and all that are registered to go to vote to die. Again, to all soldiers, you must move out of the location if you are registered to vote. Thank you very much. My name is Ms. Sylvia Lynn Hawkins. Thank you, Ms. Hawkins. Our next speaker is Matt Dowd.
Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, item 22 here. The uh, this is it, folks. The uh, the Zuma dog election. I'm calling this one. The Zuma dog election 2007. There's the date. It's March the sixth. He's uh, running in the seventh district, and this is your opportunity. We're going to pass this ordinance today. It's going to receive a unanimous vote right after my comment. And all I'm urging is. Uh, just get out that day. Um, this is the 14 year reign of Zuma Dog coming up and it starts on March the 6th, 2007. Closes our public comment for this item. Madam Clerk, can we please open the roll? Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. That is approved. Next item, please. Item number 23, call special four cards from the public. Uh, Sylvia Lynn Hawkins is our speaker on item 23. Ms. Hawkins. Ms. Sylvia Lynn Hawkins. Concerning before redeveloping all buildings, plans, schools, property, we all must be alert that all government and buildings that is owned by the United States of America government has been built under of a tunnel, a tower to destroy all illegals, people that are basically here for war versus the United States of America government. Destroy them alive Excuse me, Mr. Fire. President. She appears to be off topic on this REAP matter. Okay. Yes. Could you please uh, let us know about the uh, housing department right here, the REAP matter? And if we can't keep to that, we'll have to. Again, shut that we down. are aware enemies. Eddie Murphy. Okay. All others are We're hostage to, ask you to the planning department building in Beverly Hills. It has been taken over by black people. Okay. The Thank you, ma'am. We, we appreciate your comments today, Ms. Hawkins. Thank you. Okay. That closes our public comment for this. If we could please uh, open the roll on this item. I'm sorry, Ms. Hawkins, that was off topic. Thank you, though. Um, go, please open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. That is approved. Next item, please. Next item is item 34, and that was called special by Council Member Parks, and there are two amending motions that have okay. been distributed to the Council Members. Right, Mr. Parks, uh, we have a speaker card. We'll take that first. Uh, item 34, Matt Dowd, and then we'll hear from Mr. Parks. Yeah, thank you. This is an important one. Um, we're uh, transferring a lot of money around, and really my point here is, you know, we had the CAO, Mr. William Fujioka, come here not long ago and say he needed to have an assist, uh, have someone in place to understand what's going on here before he leaves. And I just want to read part of his report on the fiscal in impact statement. He reports all these transfers, appropriations, and adjustments totaling 53,371,937, 19,801,000 are for bond and construction projects, 10 million for reappropriations from the reserve fund, 6.7 million for appropriations from special funds, 5 million for appropriations from the unappropriated balance, 3.672 million for an appropriation from the reserve fund, 5.2 million for transfers between accounts within various departments, and funds 1.574 million for reappropriations from special funds, 760. Thank you very much, Mr. Dunn. Appreciate that. It's now Mr. Parks is our speaker. I'd like to recognize Mr. Parks. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, could I have uh, the staff come up on uh, item 34, please? Uh, colleagues, this is the first status report for this fiscal year on the uh, budget. And I think it's important that uh, staff gives you a thumbnail as to what the condition of the budget is and where we are and our expectation of funds uh, since the, the uh, last fiscal year and then also what are some of our issues primarily in dealing with uh, the potential of uh, issues and funding that we should be, uh, that are not planned for but could expect that uh, could happen during this year. So why don't we start off with giving us uh, the state of the health of the budget at this time. Uh, good morning, Council. My name is Matias Farfa with the Office of the CAO. Uh, before you, you have the first financial status report for 0607. Uh, the report provides information on several items and also pro also includes recommendations for council action. Uh, the report pretty much includes uh, a status of the 0506 year-end revenue and reversions that occurred. 
It also includes the status of the reserve fund on July 1, 2006. Also, a status on current year revenue, issues of concern in regards to that revenue, an updated five-year forecast, and again, a list of recommended actions for Council. Uh, we'll cover first uh, the 0506 year in revenue and reversions. After the close of the fiscal year, the controller's reporting uh, that the 0506 revised budget was 27 million below the, what was included in the adopted budget. The primary reason for this was a late payment that was received from the county on 0506 property tax receipts. Uh, which has since then come in in the current fiscal year and has been posted as current year revenue. Um, in regards to reversions, uh, they were 45.5 million above what was budgeted, and those reversions are detailed on attachment five of the report. Um, so after all the adjustments are made, the status of the reserve fund on July 1st, 2006 was seven million below what was in the adopted budget. Uh, the adopted budget, had a reserve fund balance of 4.3%. Uh, the actual reserve fund balance was 4.1%. So it wasn't a significant difference. In regards to the status of current year revenue, as I stated, we're currently projecting $27 million above budget by year end. Um, and that's attributable to receiving the property tax receipts uh, late from the county. And then we'll go on to the updated five-year forecast. Uh, we provided one in the fi last financial status report for 0506. Uh, the one that you have before you differs slightly from that. Uh, the changes uh, between what was in the year-end five-year forecast and what you have before you today are primarily due to updates that we made to cost of living adjustments and also for the maintenance of new facilities. Uh, regarding the Recommendations for council action. As stated by the gentleman before me, uh, we have uh, several uh, recommendations in regards to bond construction projects, reappropriations from the reserve fund, uh, reappropriations from special funds, appropriations from special funds, appropriations from the unappropriated balance, and uh, appropriations from the reserve fund. Uh, issues of concern in regards to current year revenue are in regards to UUT, UUT issues that have been discussed in previous council meetings. Uh, we are continuing to monitor, monitor the situation. Uh, we're also uh, looking into a potentially greater drop in the documentary transfer tax than what was budgeted for. Also, we're also looking into the route water threats to our water revenue transfer uh, that we do every year. I'd also like to mention at this point that the report also covers the business tax uh, receipts for the close of 0506 that they were above what was budgeted. We actually received 14.3 million above what was in the adopted budget. Uh, so that is a, a bright sign in our revenues. And at this time, if you have any questions, uh, we'd be happy to answer those. Could you go into a little bit more detail on the, the potential uh, shortfalls and the potential litigation that might impact uh, this year's budget? I wanted to comment. I wanted to comment on a couple of those issues just to add to what Matthias um, offered, then we'll get into other aspects of this report. The one thing that we're, we're most concerned about, well, there's several things. But first, you know that the real estate market is slowing down. Our documentary transfer tax is definitely um, tracking below our budget, what's in the budget. You just know that the documentary transfer tax is uh, transaction related, so when a property is sold, we get a, a percentage of that sale that, that comes in the form of a tax. And with the market slowing down, that, that revenue will decrease. But most importantly, is we're concerned about the telephone user's tax. To, it's part of the utility user's tax. Know that there is a, um, several things are going on. We, we mentioned that the federal government has changed the, um, how the federal excise tax is applied to long distance carrier. They've eliminated that tax for the long distance carrier. Soon will be applied to all local services. The, um, we currently have a lawsuit with AT&T that questions the legality of our current telephone tax. There's also actions throughout the state that have been filed by other telephone carriers against um, individual cities. The latest 
Um, the, the, recently, there was a settlement with Palo Alto, but we know that's going to follow with a major lawsuit against another city, possibly either San Jose or San Francisco. What's at risk is a potential as high as $200 million. And that's the, the, um, there's a question of whether or not we've complied or the city's complied with the 218 process for a telephone user's tax. We, we, we have taken a very strong position that our current ordinance does in fact comply, that the, um, we had instruction from this council to clarify our ordinance to, uh, to clearly demonstrate why it, 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 it is a legal tax, but it is being challenged. We, we know that we'll get an appellate court decision on the current lawsuit sometime in either late April or early May of, of next year. But again, what's in, what's in jeopardy, this, this, is a, this is a real issue. It's not something you, you should ignore. It's something we need to track very carefully because if it does hit us, it'll have a, a significant impact on the city's finances. And with that, what, 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 what I think is very important now that we place some precautionary and in some respects necessary controls on all city departments to ensure that they are managing their resources, particularly their financial resources, in, in a responsible manner. Uh, one of the things that I think colleagues uh what Bill is referring to, and we know we've stayed out of the, the uh, dreaded word freeze for the last couple of years, and we're not at that point, but I, I think the issue for all of us to be aware of as we deal with our committee assignments is that there is a need to have caution as to not only people that were spending within their budget, but how they're spending their allocated uh, resources, because even though they may have vacancies, uh, this is not the time just to try to fill them all at one time. Uh, it's a uh, necessity of looking at the priorities of the most important positions and filling those uh, and basically using the, the uh, access to the whole fiscal year as it relates to their personnel needs. And I think it's important that as we go through our second and third uh, status report, we will be giving you uh, more information as we move forward as it relates to the condition of the budget. Uh, and as Bill said, there's some, as always, fluctuating income uh, that comes from different sources, but those liabilities on those lawsuits uh, could really cause all of that uh, management that we've done over the last couple of years to uh, go by the wayside because uh, we could be dealing with some major uh, gaps that we have to fill. And so it's important that uh, we understand that that uh, is upon us. And Bill, uh, there was a couple of other, you dealt with the excise tax, but wasn't, uh, we have a couple other pending uh, lawsuits that were major, such as the, uh, uh, what is it, the uh, sanitation and also is it Bighorn or something up north that we're dealing with at a potential impact? You want to jump in? Go ahead. Go ahead. <clears throat> One of the issues that has been mentioned, you mentioned uh, the Bighorn issue. Uh, that is something that uh, we are tracking, the city attorney is taking a look at. Uh, there are some concerns as far as the decisions that, were, that came down. However, we do believe that the city has a valid uh, standing uh, based on its current ordinance and what was adopted by the voters uh, back in, in 1999. So we'll be looking to, uh, we believe we're on solid ground and we'll be looking to have a strong defense of regarding that case any water transfers. Okay. Uh, what is our expectation for the uh, second financial status report? What's the timing that we're looking at? We're hoping to get a report out in the next couple of weeks and we would like to get a re report to your committee before the end of the year. Before the end of the year. And then uh, uh, might also comment on the issue of the fact that we were lower in our reserve fund than we had projected. I think at the end of the year we're thinking of somewhere in the neighborhood of about five, just at five percent. And with some of the transition, we're more in line at about just over 3%. Could you explain what some of those moves are and why the reserve fund was impacted? When the, the budget was put together, we anticipated that there would be a, a basic year in or basic reserve fund balance of approximately $185 million based on some of the transactions uh, and the, the lower property tax revenue. Uh, we ended up with about $176 million, which is slightly less. Since then, uh, there have been some uh, loans and other transfers from the reserve fund that have reduced the balance further, and I believe we're roughly about 130, a little, little bit more than 130 million. Now, a big piece of that was a $30 million loan for the police headquarters, 
and uh, based on what has been approved over the last couple of weeks for the bond financing, we should have that loan paid back by the end of the year, if not first part of January. So that should bump us back up into $160 million. Now, we are a little concerned that we are lower than where we hope to be. And, and part of um, our reasoning to, to actually sort of look at some current year issues, um, make sure folks are you know, only hiring those folk, you know, people that are critically needed, you know, make sure we minimize any um, non-critical items, any transfers from the UB, things of that sort to make sure that we can build, uh, start building that reserve fund balance back up. Okay. And also, would you comment on the discussion in the Finance Committee where we gave the CAO some direction of how to address the uh, issue of what might be attrition in the police department, the unexpected high attrition, and, and, and to look at the issue of how we might fill some of those gaps before we lose the, uh, the large number of people on drop, and, uh, and, and if we've made any analysis on that at this time. Maybe I can help with that. We, um, we were asked by the councilman to look at the current hiring um, patterns in LAPD to ensure that as the attrition increased through through um, drop and through through normal retirements and also transfers out of our department that we keep pace with the attrition and also stay on track in meeting our overall hiring goal, particularly with the concern of trying to add you know, additional officers to the department. And so we were asked to come back with an analysis and to, to, to to determine whether or not we should increase the size of the academy classes in the near future to address that attrition issues. We'll be coming back with a separate report. Okay. Uh, colleagues, uh, this is the first report and I, I think it stands on its own as far as the information. The one thing I want to add verbally is a direction that was asked in uh, budget and finance but didn't get in the report that we directed the CAO to uh, do a audit of the uh, police overtime and that it was a nine or close to eight to nine million dollar uh, overage in this financial status report we're fortunate that it was that gap was closed by the fact that we had about a 15 million dollar uh, uh, overage in the salary account which due to a tri uh, higher than expected attrition so it balanced that out but we asked for a more specific audit because that overtime has been an issue over the last couple of years and we also direct as part of that direction to the CAO is to also direct the police department to cooperate with them to give them the information and the specifics that we gave on that uh, chart in committee is some of the areas that we asked to be uh, expanded on. So we can add that to the committee report. We'd appreciate it. We would like to read into the um, into this particular motion some additional instructions to the general managers, but also to to our office. And there's a couple of other motions that we need to. Um, to um, transfer some money to some critical capital programs. But, Matthias? Okay, the, the following, I would like to read the following into the record is to instruct uh, city general managers to, one, limit the filling of vacancies to only critical and essential public service positions to address legal or public health and safety emergencies, and to include a brief statement with their monthly employment level reports that identifies the positions filled during the previous month and the reasons why. Uh, two, to defer any new initiatives that require additional general fund support until they have been evaluated and, and approved for 0708. Number three, reduce expenditures to generate internal savings to cover any, an, any anticipated deficits for the remainder of the fiscal year and to ensure that no new general fund appropriations will be needed. Four, ensure that all revenue tar targets will be met or exceeded. Five ensure that reserve fund loans are paid back on a timely basis. Six, continue efforts to attain full cost recovery of special services by adjusting fees and including annual inflationary increases. And seven, and conduct a thorough review of all prior year encumbrances and identify those that can be reverted to the reserve fund. Okay, is that what he's reading? And those are the instructions for the city general managers. Uh, the second section is to instruct the CAO to one, review with departments all unspent prior year MICLA monies that are over three years old and provide recommendations on sweeping those unspent prior year monies to Budget and Finance Committee. And two, include in its mid-year financial status report recommendations for budget adjustments and other fiscal actions that will increase the city's reserve fund. Okay. Uh, colleagues, we have a, a 
a amending motion circulating that articulated oh, what was okay. just read so that we'll, everybody will get a copy of it and the clerk can survive uh, trying to copy <laughs> that. So uh, that should be coming around just a second. Thank you very much, Mr. Parks. We have Mr. Zine, uh, Ms. Perry, Mr. LaBonge, and then Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, you mentioned 27 million below, then you mentioned 7 million, and then you mentioned 27 million, 14.3 with the business tax. The bottom line, are we up or down as far as the revenues, considering all aspects? As if you don't, because some of the numbers, if you look were, at everything, that's what um, I want to look at. And we'll, we'll put the telephone users tax aside. But if property you look transfer at, tax, if you look and all at the everything, issues. we're on target. Okay, on we're, target we're just, what we projected. We're, we're slightly off, but we're, we're essentially we're on target. At this time of the year, we can easily say we're on target. But we're, we're advising you as strongly as we can that the telephone usage tax is a real issue and we need to be ready for it. And when is the possible date of the implementation of that? We will get the appellate decision probably, like I said, late April or early May. Uh, now that, that's a fluid date because appellate decisions, you know, they have their own schedule, but we'll get it probably late in this fiscal year. And then that will take effect in the next budget, July 1st. There won't be any impact on the current it will, budget. It will impact our 7-8 um, budget, yes. And that's $250 million? You no, know, it, it could be around $200 million. So about 200 yes. that we anticipate that we won't receive. Yes. So a $200 million. That, that, that is what, what's at risk. So right now, the plan, as we discussed in earlier, um, on earlier agenda, not, not today, but in earlier sections of this council, is to aggressively defend ourselves to the litiga litigation process, pursue legislative remedies, and then um, we'll come back to you if those two s actions fail and tell you the next step. And if you hold my time, Mr. President, is California League of Cities and other jurisdictions joining on this? or is Absolutely. It this is an um, effort that impacts the entire state of California. It is not an LA City issue. Right now, the, um, some of the telephone carriers have sued um, well, I mentioned there's a Palo Alto suit. There, there are other cities. What's very interesting is in the recent election, six cities put this issue on the ballot and went through the 218 process. The city of Compton was able to pass it at a 90% vote. San Marino had about a 70% vote. But of the eight cities who put it on the ballot, six were successful in passing the um, and complete the, the required 218 process for this tax. But we're so, asking, we're asking the, the courts and hopefully... Well, we feel what we have in place is legal. And so we need to defend our current position and, and, and aggressively defend it and then decide what we do at the conclusion of that process. And who's if we're successful, there's nothing to do. We, and we who's, just, who's carrying that defense forward for us? Uh, we have uh, the city attorney and then outside counsel. So city attorney and outside counsel. Yes, we have an together. expert and outside counsel. A another question on, on number 34, which we're discussing regarding the uh, police overtime for the holidays. Is there, on this motion that, uh, that I introduced with Councilman Smith, uh, calling for this holiday season that we determine if there's any overtime that could be utilized for those areas that are experiencing increase in crime, gang, etc., and also to have additional holiday deployment in the shopping centers. Because if people don't go shopping during the holidays, we're going to lose sales tax revenue. We want to make it a safe environment. Is there any possibility, and this motion calls for the police department to come forward along with the budget folks to see if there are dollars available during that short time, basically between the, uh, the end of Thanksgiving and the end of the year? We need to come back to you. I, I know this is a very important issue. Currently, we're tracking at minimum an $8 million deficit in the police overtime account. I thought Mr. Park said that that was resolved with the $15 million that we were Well, it's resolved that. if we take money from other accounts within the police department, but it still represents a very significant issue. So uh, identifying the money, it becomes, it's a function of priorities. And we can look within the department, but there will be an impact. So if you take money from one account, they won't be able to do um, what 
the money in that account was intended to, um, but to support. We're, we're, ta we're talking about money for recruitment, and are the numbers coming in as we budget for, or the numbers lower than what we budget for? Right now, if you look at the department's Warren overtime account, they're, they're looking, projecting about a $20 million shortfall. Of that in, the 20, sworn, in the sworn overtime the account. sworn overtime account. Of that 20 million, roughly about 10 million is what we'll call reimbursable, meaning time spent out at LAX and other grants, we anticipate that we'll be reimbursed. That leaves about $10 million that basically we're not expecting a reimbursement, they're, they're just over. Um, I, actually, and we did pr provide a report to um, committee that actually spelled out some of the areas where they're over, and we actually provide that to your office as well. So the issue is we have a $10 million hole that we're trying to fill. Now, we do have some salary savings in the sworn overtime or uh, the sworn account due to hiring and so forth. It becomes, as the CEO mentioned, it becomes a balance as to whether or not do you want to have schedule another class this year, do you want to increase class sizes, or, or do you want to maybe try to funnel some money into additional overtime no, no, no. where we already have we were, a shortfall. We but that's my point. Funds. The applicant is the applicant pool there to expand that, or are we lower than what we anticipate for the applicant pool? Our personnel department, with through Maggie Whalen, is is I think doing a, a very good job in trying to increase that applicant pool. And the classes have they're basically on target right now. The question is with the higher attrition. Do you increase that target? But I would strongly advise against moving money from the sworn hiring account because we have a commitment to, uh, to increase the number of officers. That money needs to be set aside. And if, in fact, the, um, as, as the personnel implements some new initiatives to increase the recruitment, uh, improve the recruitment effort and increase the candidate pool, there may be the possibility of, of adding a class. That's something we should, uh, if we can, we should consider. That's what Consumer Parks was talking about. Well, I just want to close with this. If we can find some dollars between that short season, between the, during the holiday season, to assist in the shopping center areas, I know the police department's done some effort, as well as those areas that are impacted by crime, during that short window, and basically ending at the end of the year, and then whatever normalcy we go back to as far as the budget. If you could report that back when you go back with it. We'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Perry. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I just needed to make sure that this was included uh, in the financial status report, so uh, the amendment that I need to make sure is there is to transfer uh, $76,135 from sites and facilities fund 209-88 from account 209 entitled Ross Snyder Recreation to account A140. Uh, that is to be able to uh, remove the building that has long been uh, um, an issue in the park, and it will incre increase and enhance the public safety. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Uh, Mr. Labonge is next, and then Mr. Reyes and Mr. Rosenthal. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Fujioka, with today's modern technology, can you uh, hit a button and find out how much it costs to run a city daily? Uh, estimated. We could do that. Good. Maybe not a button, but it'd be a series of buttons. <laughs> yeah, a series of buttons. But we could do I that. I think it would be uh, fruitful to watch that, and I and I appreciate Mr. Park's uh, effort and the committee effort here in having this come up. But to know the the magnitude of this municipal corporation of five billion dollars and how important it is, I'm reviewing all aspects of uh, time and being able to you know work best practices. Uh, what other cities may have been doing around. I hope you look at that particular issue here. Which, which we are. And I, and I fear the uh, uh, lawsuits that we have on the issues of the big lawsuit of the uh, uh, inter telecommunications uh, lawsuit with the phone companies and what it could be on that issue there. Are our payments between governments, federal government to the municipal government or the state government, county government, how, uh, how are they trans? acting in between. Is there any lag time in between? Uh, we're, we're pretty, the, the process has improved immensely and, and that's, that's not a significant issue for us. The feds, the state, you know, what, where there are delays, we work with them and we, we, we correct those problems as quickly as possible. We had a delay between the county and the city 
for a property tax payment. They rec we identified that the problem immediately, and at and with the same expediency, the county um, um, admitted this problem and made the correct adjustment. So we did receive the money. Um, we're, we're very much on top of that. And also, I just wanted to ask on personnel issues there. Uh, you know, I think, uh, I know times have changed, but my own uh, secretary, uh, Executive Secretary Dorothy Perez, I think she took a test on a Tuesday and started working on a Monday uh, the following week. This is some years ago. Now it takes weeks and weeks to process, or months and months to process all employees, which uh, I don't know if that is the, uh, what's the best practice on those issues as we relate to? Uh, well, I I've hiring. seen the personnel department make some improvements in that area. What's happened is that, like anything else, um, the personnel department could probably add, you know, a dozen bodies to the examination and classification function to, um, and you'd see a, an immediate benefit. But yet, because of our other priorities, particularly police and um, well, public safety hiring, many police, but we have GSD officers, we have air, airport officers and so on, we've had to shift resources to that particular function. But I've seen some improvements um, for, for a number of exams where they've gone faster. Uh, so it, this, it's happening, but it, yeah. right now we, ha we do have, we, we've told Maggie in her department that, you know, public safety, and rightfully so, is our top priority. And so with that comes bodies and resources to achieve those priorities. Well, I just wanted to ask a question, too. I have a motion I'm putting in today to ask that there be a marriage between the City of Los Angeles and the Community College District, a stronger marriage of the nine campuses around Los Angeles, not all in the city, but all serving the city. Uh, job training is so important. Is there any way to uh, have some classes at the community colleges that would then, when they come to apply for a job in the city of Los Angeles, they're that further ahead? Meaning if well, I took... I, I like to see that with, excuse me, sir. Yeah. Uh, I like to see that with our, um, from our high schools to the community colleges to our local state universities. Right. Um, that would just make a whole ton of sense. So maybe the motion would be to ask um, um, the personnel department to report back on that type of relationship. Right. I, I just think it's real important, members, because of on jobs, I, the water power jobs, the line, uh, people who work in the lines, the transmission, many of those are uh, going to outer state people because we haven't trained or given the opportunity to train people in, even in our own city. Uh, and also on these other issues of public safety as well. So I thank you. Thank you Great. for the mid-report. And then next time I see you, let me know how many buttons you push to get the number, what it costs to run the city on this date, the 21st of November, 2006. We'll thank you. Thank you, Mr. LaBonge. Our next speaker will be Mr. Reyes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I want to ask our, our CAO, realizing it's one of his last and fewest, fewer meetings as we come to the end of this uh, tenure. Uh, in the past few years, we've been suffering major budget cuts. Three more council meetings. Three more council meetings. So we're winding down. Mr. Fujioka, you've seen uh, the city go through its changes in the past few years as we went through significant block grant cuts, uh, federal subsidies used to fund child care and, and senior services. We've gone back to old money years to try to keep some of these programs alive. I do recall a time in which we cut back child care and we had a hearing here for three or four hours with many organizations that were le basically left out in the cold. Yeah, I remember that. Um, as you were going through your analysis here, have we been able to keep in perspective what other cuts are in the horizon given these trends of, of budget cuts that we've been going through? Were we able to look at it from, from that point of view? Was there any kind of uh, analysis in that regard? Please hold well, my time. I think what's very important, and it's, you've heard it from, I know your peers, you've said it probably the loudest, but also the um, members of this council, but, but then our mayor, is the, um, the importance to go through that analysis and not just go through across the board cuts. Because across the board cuts for all departments fail to recognize um, city priorities. And so we are doing that. The other thing that I'm really encouraged with is with the recent change through the, the last election 
And given that um, we have more friends in, the, in Washington, D.C., and friends in very important positions, is that we need to start, we need to look at the formula and how money is allocated to Los Angeles. Because right now, I don't, given our size, given um, our role in several very important industries, I don't, we all know we don't get our fair share of federal funds, sure. and even state funds. We need to get a greater, we need to change the formula. But uh, again, when we went through these cutbacks, we lost a continuum of services. Let's take, for example, the yes. homeless issue. Uh, support programs and nonprofits that dealt with folks who were in need of mental or, or some health or, or physical support and lost their jobs or lost their income and become homeless. I mean, we're, do we have someone in our departments that have the ability to say, these are our needs and these are our formulas that work for us? Do we have that expertise in-house? Oh, absolutely, in every department. And, and know that um, with that election, and given that we have, I think we have the opportunity for, um, to get much stronger support from the federal government, the, um, the mayor has already gone on record in going to each department to ask for that analysis, because it's his intent to, um, to increase that, that, that distribution and improve the formulas. Could we ask a report back in this action to identify existing gaps when you look at, and I would rely on you to pick a year that. that reflects all the cutbacks we suffered, maybe in the last two years or three years, that dealt with support services for the homeless, child care, and senior services? We'll do that. And, we can and, do that. We can identify the, the federal money that, that's been lost over the years. Right. We know we've lost block grant money. We know we lost some We of were at 33 million in one year, 28 million in one year. Uh, but we also lost significant dollars for gang intervention and, and youth yes. job yes. development programs. We'll do that for you. Uh, please, because I think we put in a context what we've lost and what we're not addressing. And to balance out, I understand support for police officers. I think that's critical. But at one point, the city has to recognize there's a carrot and there's a stick. I understand. And, and so I want to understand that part of it. And the last question, we've been going through a series of hearings when we're asking every department to look at how they allocate contracts, how they allocate um, jobs in terms of opportunities for youth and recycling our dollars in our own city. Uh, we're asking the department managers and directors and working with personnel that we should make that part of their evaluation process. How much of their budget was actually recycled into the city by keeping contracts within the city and or within the, the region? Um, are our departments looking at hiring locally or hiring youth as a priority, or are they being viewed as more as a public relations gesture, given how these budgets have been expended? Do you have a perspective on that? Well, you, you heard Councilman LaBonge ask us to report back on, or at least having personnel report back on relationships we can develop with our schools, from the high school to the community colleges to the state universities. I, I, I'm, a, I'm an absolute believer in that. There should be um, just clear avenues for that person who's in junior high or high school to say, well, if I have complete these type of classes, I can get a clerical job with the city. If I go to community college or even a, a um, place like Trade Tech for the, for the crafts, if I complete these classes, I get a pass to a city job. So putting that structure in place, I, I, I've been a very strong advocate of that. I think that but, should happen. But we, we have a mechanism, we can create a mechanism where we can identify each department's budget and say, this is how much went back in the city because of local hiring, local contracts. Can we create a methodology where we can assess that performance so that the accountability is real, it's in black and white? We could, it would take some effort, but it would probably be, um, it would be worth the effort, but we could, the city could do that. Could we get a report back on, on how that can be done? We'll, we'll report back on the mechanics to achieve that. I appreciate that very much. That'd Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Our next speaker will be Mr. Rosendahl. Thank you, Madam President. Appreciate that. Um, Bill, we're going to miss you.
three more council meetings. You know what I like about you? Your integrity, your honesty, your openness. And my 15 months on the council, every time you speak, I know I'm speaking with somebody that has done his homework and has integrity. So you'll be a tremendous loss to all of us. Well, I appreciate that. that. Um, my big deal is this structural deficit. Explain yes. what it is and tell me how we can get rid of it. Well, we have a plan in place. Our budget plan speaks to how please. we'll be addressing the structural problem. But essentially, Hold what, my time, what we're please. looking at is current ongoing costs compared to anticipated and, and ongoing revenue. And the, the difference there, the delta, the difference represents your structural problem. And so uh, that's why we think it's extremely important that we, we that, that departments meet their revenue targets, that we look at efficiencies, to, where, where you have departments come in and say, I need 40 more positions to do X, Y, Z. The answer should be, if X, Y, Z is a priority, how can you perform those duties and responsibilities related to X, Y, Z within your existing resources? How can you restructure your existing resources to still perform those, those duties? Because oftentimes, it's very easy for a department to come in and say, just give me more. If you want me to do more, just give me more. The, the pushback should be, how can you be more efficient within your own organization? Because uh, it's just there. How a lot, big is a the lot of it is there. How big is the structure? Well, we're tracking about in the mid 200s right now, about 250 right now on, on an ongoing basis. And that, that, could, that, that figure could move. If we lose the UUT and the telephone users tax, it will be significantly more. If we, um, if we push our revenue for some critical categories, it could be less. If we, um, if we make the hard decisions and hard choices um, related to um, some of our benefit structures, it will have an impact. Help me on that. Explain what you mean by benefit structures. Well, uh, it, it starts with um, an employee's salary. It starts with health benefits. It starts with retirement benefits. I'm a very, very strong uh, proponent of, of paying individuals a fair wage. But if we go beyond what could be characterized by any reasonable person as a fair wage, it will have, it'll have an impact on our budget. The, um, the retirement benefits is something that everyone deserves, and I'm, you know, I'll be the last one to complain about that given where I'm at right now in my life. But it's also um, some cities and counties have made the mistake, not LA, we've been very responsible, but have made the mistake of significantly enhancing the retirement benefit to the detriment of their, um, of their, of their finances, their financial status. And so we need to be responsible in that regard. And so if we do look at any changes to the retirement structure, we make sure that on an ongoing basis we can afford those changes. But we've been very, very good there. But we need to hold, hold the line there. By holding the line, would you suggest that new employees, future employees, have a different benefit package that is less uh, generous or not? No, see, I, I've never been a proponent of two-tiered systems. You create two-tiered systems, then you have the same people doing the job who are getting paid differently or receiving a different benefit, and it just creates problems and animosity. I, I, I would not suggest that. but. We have a good retirement benefit now. Some cities have gone to, for civilian employees, to 2.5. Some went to 2.7. Some went as high as 3.0. Those cities are, gonna, are facing huge problems right now in their uh, retirement systems and the unfunded okay, liability. Okay, so basically you're saying to cut out that $240 million structural deficit, we need to spend less in each department no, or we, live we, within we, our means or something. Live within our means and be smarter in how we spend our money mm -hmm. and identify some efficiencies. Mm -hmm. the, um, in the budget, and what's been promised on an ongoing basis by, um, by our mayor, is that every year we'll find 15 to $20 million in efficiencies. That's a great start. That's a great goal. But we can do more. There's some ideas. In fact, we're going through a brainstorming session now with all of our budget teams to identify those very specific ideas. Mm -hmm. Some represent some significant policy changes and decisions that we're gonna to have to bring to this council, but they're absolutely doable, they're achievable. Can you share some of those significant policy changes with well, us? Well, once, once we flush them out, 
Uh, one thing I'd like to do, I think we should do, is very basic, is we agree on a staffing model for every police station so that we ensure that um, the sworn staff or police officers are doing police related work that, that, that has that impact on public safety and where we can civilianize positions, we do so. The, the chief has talked about his support of that because he knows he's understaffed. He doesn't have enough police officers. So those that we have should be out there fighting crime. And where we can have civilians do more than administrative or, or staff work, we should achieve that goal. Could we uh, save significant monies on that? Oh, absolutely. How much do you think? Well, the difference in, in just let's say a management analyst, a police officer, there's a significant amount of money there, difference there. So it'd be hard to put a dollar figure on it, but we can. You, we can. What about zero-based budgeting, where every position in any bureaucracy that exists now has to be justified? Because, you know, yesterday some of these things should have sunsetted or maybe they have sunsetted. What are we doing about the personnel, the budget slots, and the history well, of that? A lot of has been said about zero-based budgeting and stripping everything down to its core and rebuilding it. It's for a department like ours, a city hold like my time, please. For a city like ours, there are some items that are just not going to go away. You're not going to zero base your police officers and your firefighters and, and the refuge truck operators and I can go down the list of 911 operators. You never zero base those because we don't have enough to begin with. But asking every department to go into the department and uh, every department head and look at um, the cost of doing business and looking at the fees to make sure we're getting cost recovery and making sure we hit revenue targets is something we should be doing right now. Well, thank you very much. And again, thank we're going to miss you, Bill. Um, and colleagues, um, when we go through the budget process this year, uh, it's not going to be as simple as we did last year. Uh, and you won't have my jokes. That. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rosendahl. Our next speaker is Mr. Parks. Thank you, Madam oh, Chair. Uh, sir, if you're ready to close, yeah. but I have one more that's related to the Banning Museum. Yes. And it's to authorize the controller to transfer $175,852 from Prop K Fund number 43K um, from account Y363 Banning Museum Phase 2 to General Services. And, th and this is the construct the fence around the Banning Museum that's been sorely needed and long delayed and I'll give this this document to um, the clerk so we have it. it it's already been distributed yeah. it has been so that's part of this motion great I want I just wanted to make sure it's there okay thank you I think we're up to D on, on amendments <laughs> ABC and then whatever Miss Perry was there was a clarification on the Ross Snyder Ross Snyder and I think we just did D on on uh, Lauren Miller should have been circulated. It hasn't been distributed yet. Okay, so that should be circulated. Uh, it's been introduced, so it's still being circulated. But let me just say, colleagues, uh, I appreciate uh, what Bill has done, and the, uh, we will be indebted to him and his staff for creating the financial policies forever because it gives us a platform to really manage the city's budget. Without it, we would be just plugging holes each and every day trying to figure out where money's coming from and where we should place it. So uh, what we also are expecting shortly, we just saw it come out of budget and finance, is another part of the financial policies that deals with developmental uh, sub subsidies as opposed to waivers, and we'll keep moving on that. But I think that the work that he's done uh, uh, within the CAO's office uh, will be something that future budgets will certainly uh, be guided by. And so I think I just want to say thank to him personally for his effort and his staff. And also with the amendments today up through D, as far as I can count, I'd ask we get an I vote. Uh, and then we look forward to the issue of the second status report before the end of the year that gives us some idea of the fluctuating situation in our finances. And I also appreciate, Bill, the explanation about the structural deficit because there's still debate whether it exists and there's still debate whether it's harmful. And I think sometimes the way you and the CLA and others manage this significant budget, often they're not the downfalls that people expect. They're not the closing of stations. They're not uh, laying off people. So there's a perception that it really doesn't exist and that we each year are crying wolf and then we find the money. Uh, this goes on uh, for 12 months of budgeting 
that causes those things not to occur. And I just Which want to say true. thank you. So ask true. for an I vote on yes. this report and the amendments. Thank you, Mr. Parks. There are no further speakers in the queue. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please open the roll? Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Thank you. Next item, please. Next item is item 41, and that was called special for cards from the public. Okay. Item 41, uh, Matt Dowd, we have a card for? Yeah, thank you, and uh, congratulations, uh, Mr. President, for the uh, New Frontier Award. I know you deserve it because you really are opening up new frontiers all over the city, and uh, we're watching. So congratulations. And uh, Mr. City Attorney, that's really so far off the topic, but we let that one go, huh? Anyway, USC... It's a, it's, a, it's a great little event, and uh, this is our local college right here in downtown LA. They're heading for another college football championship. Pete Carroll's done a great job. Matt Linus not there anymore, but I think he rolled to a win in the weekend for the Cardinals. And... Uh, Let's hope there's no Vince Youngs this year. And I noticed Vince Young rolled to a great win, too, I think, in the weekend. Thank you very much, Mr. Dunn. Um, anybody wishing from the council to speak on this? Seeing none, let's open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. Next item, please. Item 45, call special four cards from the public. OK, uh, Michael Hunt. Mr. Hunt here. OK, uh, Mr. Dowd. Thank you. This is, uh, this is a, a lovely little item. And uh, when, you, when you hear the CAO talk about the kind of money that we're throwing around in the city, this really is a nothing item. I want a unanimous vote on this. It comes from uh, Councilwoman Hahn and uh, Councilman Labonge. Great work. The Thanksgiving dinner for the homeless and community we want to see a few more of these. We need a Venice one too, I think. And uh, hopefully the councilman for that district is listening. Get one of these organized, $1,200. Let's knock it through. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Let's open the roll on this item. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. Um, I had a request from Mr. Padilla to go forthwith on three matters. Um, and if there is no objection to that, we can go forth with, please, on items 2, 3, and 82. Um, next item, please. Next item is item 51, and that was called special by Councilmember Parks. All right. Mr. Parks, we have item 51. Why don't we go ahead to the next one? Hold that on the desk for a moment. Uh, 52 was called special for a card from the public. Okay. Mr. Dowd, item 52. Thank you. Yeah, Matt Dowd. Channel 35 holding up the show for the outlaws. I've got to keep making a mention of these every time I see them because it appears to the general public that we're not solving a lot of these uh, murder, you know, unfortunate deaths of, you know, citizens. And I think the problem with these is. Uh, the money's not enough because you have to reveal your identity to get the reward. And uh, the loyalty between these people and also the threat of retaliation is usually too much for a paltry 50,000. You know, if you can get 2.7 million, well, you, you, it's not, you, you, it's, it's been vetoed by the mayor, but look, we need to fix these, get an anonymous tip line happening with some kind of payment, and you probably get homeless people who witness crimes will come forward. Thank you. And just as a point of information, we do have an anonymous tip line for any tips. That's one eight seven seven ask lapd And uh, there's a separate tip line as well when you go to the LAPD website. So we appreciate that. Uh, anybody wishing to be heard on this? If not, let's open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. Next item, please. 
The next item, Mr. President, is uh, 70 was called special by Councilmember Parks. Do you wish to hold that on the desk let's also? Let's hold that on the desk. We do have public comment cards. I know we're going to go into closed session on 63 and 67, but let's take public comment on those now. Um, item 63, Michael Hunt. He's not here. All right. Item 67, Mr. Hunt again. And uh, Mr. Dowd. If anybody else would like to speak, just fill out a speaker card and give it to the guard, and we'll make sure you can be heard. 67. Yeah, thank you. Item 67, uh, it's a closed session item to uh, discuss and uh, award a settlement in this case. Stanley Miller versus City of Los Angeles. And I'm in favor of settling this, and let's be generous. This is a use of force incident, and uh, you know, they, these are, you know, th this is no dog food incident. Um, and we, we see this use of force issue coming up a lot. We're seeing it on YouTube, Deep South 81. So I want to see a nice, juicy settlement for this one. We want to really, we want to send a message and uh, satisfy these people because you know, if we keep the community happy, then the police will be happy. But as long as the community is suing everybody, the police, the city, it will never sir. end. I believe we have one other speaker who's filling out the card. Would you like to come forward, sir? And we'll make, why don't you come forward and state your name? And then we will, uh, we'll collect your card after you speak. Thank you. On item uh, 67, this is the Stanley Miller versus uh, City of Los Angeles case. If you come a little closer so we can hear you, sir. Good morning, Councilman. Thank you. Uh, I'm as a concerned citizen. I'm trying to work for the homeless on Skid Row. And I see the city of, of Skid Row, especially the downtown area, the sidewalks and the streets have been very neglect neglected. I'm sorry, sir. We're, we're, uh, we're talking about a specific item right now, number 67. So if you have comments on that, it's the Stanley Miller case. Otherwise, we, we had general public comment before. Um, and we have that each day. We welcome that during general public comment, but we have to talk about the Miller case right now. So if you have anything to say about the Miller case, we'd be happy to hear you. Uh, okay, I'm sorry about this, sir. We'll, we'll make sure somebody explains that to you. Thank you very much. That closes public comment on that item. Um, and we have, I believe, two items, but we'll take those up. Is Mr. Parks uh, uh, close? And there's also item number 80 that was called switched by Council Member Hahn. Okay, why don't we take that one up. Ms. Hahn, we have item number, is, sorry, is 88? 80. 80. Uh, we have item number 80, Ms. Hahn, for you. That is the, um, hold on, I get my uh, This item, and I I'm, I'm, uh, want to bring it up before our, some of our members of the public bring up another uh, item where we're waiving fees uh, for an event. But I wanted to bring special attention to this one and say why this is exactly the kind of nonprofit organization that we should uh, waive these fees for. And I want everyone to put on their calendars next uh, October 28th through se November 2nd, 2007, uh, Jimmy Carter, ex-president Jimmy Carter, who uh, works with Habitat for Humanity, every year chooses one project in the world uh, to make it his Jimmy Carter work project. And um, he has chosen San Pedro to be the site of the Jimmy Carter Work Project next, uh, next fall. We're going to be building 16 homes in San Pedro and then another 14 units in Harbor Gateway. We expect to have thousands of volunteers uh, coming into Los Angeles and into San Pedro and Harbor Gateway to build these homes. Uh, we have already had a meeting with all city departments. Uh, from planning and building and safety and fire to make sure that uh, everyone's on track. Uh, we build these homes in a week. So we blitz build all these homes in one week. It's fascinating. But, you know, we believe in affordable housing in Los Angeles. Uh, we were not able to pass Measure H, which we thought would have brought a lot of money uh, to bear on affordable housing. But this is an idea of a project that uh, by waiving the fees, we can allow Habitat for Humanity to partner with the City of Los Angeles in doing just what we believe in, which is providing decent, affordable housing for working people in Los Angeles. So uh, I know you're going to support uh, the waiver of fees on this. It's worth highlighting that every once in a while, 
we partner with great organizations that really do help us accomplish our goals, which is to provide decent housing for people in Los Angeles. Uh, I would like to invite Mr. Dowd personally to be a volunteer on that project next fall. I want to see you uh, with a hammer and, uh, and, to, and, and building homes for people. Thank you very much, and, and congratulations on that. And as a point of information, I know that they're looking for potential projects throughout the city as well where we can be doing some refurbishment of houses and the housing department. So if any council members are interested, let Ms. Hahn know and Habitat for Humanity know because we will have probably thousands of homes that will be affected as well as the new ones built. So it's very exciting. Let's open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. Uh, we have two items that we are holding um, for Mr. Parks, but we also have our closed session items. So why don't we go ahead, if Mr. Parks uh, is on his way back, to go to closed session right now. So in accordance with California state law, we will now go into executive session to discuss uh, legal matters that are before us and settlement proceedings, and we will come back into open session um, and announce any votes that we have taken uh, requiring a public announcement. Thank you very much. We'll be back shortly. Yeah, we're absent. Okay, next item please, Madam Clerk. Item 65 is settlement uh, in the case of uh, Thomas Wilson versus City of Los Angeles, and that's in the amount of $125,000. Okay, let's open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 10 ayes. And next one. Uh, next item is item 66, and that is settlement in the case of John Rose versus City of Los Angeles, and that's uh, $98,095. Okay, please open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. That is approved. Any announcements or uh, adjourning motions will be delayed till tomorrow, folks. So with that, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Han, LaBange, Padilla, Parks, Reyes, Smith, Weiss, Wesson, and Garcetti. Thank you very much, colleagues. This meeting is adjourned. We will have our last meeting before the Thanksgiving break tomorrow. Um, and are there any motions we need to post and refer before that? I'm sorry. That's, yes, council does have motions for posting and referral. Let's post and refer those. And we'll, any excuses we will deal with as well tomorrow. Mr. City Attorney, is there anything else you'd like to announce? Uh, just, just to clarify, uh, Mr. President, item number 69 was voted on in closed session. And was that voted on in open session also? Uh, no, that was not. Okay. Um, and that's in the amount of... 215000 Okay. As long as that is made public. Okay. Thank you all very much. Colleagues, this meeting is adjourned. We'll see you again. Uh, tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Thanks. I haven't picked up any